documentary photographer Daniel Milner joins Mark Silver to discuss five things he wish he knew before he became a professional photographer. The first thing I wish I knew was I wish I this goes back to the early 90s. I wish I knew that digital was coming so that I could have really taken the time to appreciate what it was like to come up in the analog era. And when I say analog era, there's a couple of elements that are key. One is the time required to do analog photography, which is pretty extensive. The pace at which you do analog photography, because at the time, I wasn't even scanning everything. I was processing film and printing in the darkroom. That was the only option I had. Yeah. And also the, the physicality of analog in terms of being in the darkroom and being on your feet all day, working with your hands, and even making prints in the darkroom. If you've never done that, it is a very physical experience. I mean, it you're is. kind of you're going like this and you've got little dodging things and burning things. And it's like this weird dance that you're doing in the darkroom. It was the only thing we knew. And, and even in like 92, 93, when the rumors, when Kodak was like rumoring that this new technology was coming, instead of like saying, okay, that's the future, I need to take a, a second to appreciate what I have, I just, I just took it for granted. The primary point that I missed was the pace. The pace of life and the pace of analog photography was much, much, much slower yes. than digital. And, and that pace translated into every aspect of being a professional photographer. As soon as the te digital technology arrived, every editor, every art buyer, every assignment just shortened <clears throat> exponentially. You had people like, we need it now, we need it right now, we need everything now, it has to be now. Even though they didn't need it, it just, in everyone's mind, it was this monumental shift over and I never took the time to appreciate analog. All, All right. right, point number two. I wish I knew how hard professional photography was going to be so that I could have shot more and worked harder. Um, being a professional photographer did not get easier over the years. It got more difficult. And what got more difficult was not the actual making of the photographs. You get better. You're in training. It's like an athlete working out. It's like a tennis player spending four or five hours on the court every day. You will get better. Yeah. But what got more difficult was the business playing field and the business of photography and you can get distracted. And especially, and a, a really good photographer out of Seattle named Stuart Isaac was, uh, I saw this on LinkedIn yesterday. He, he said, I always tell young photographers, you not one, you have to shoot all the time, but two, you have to shoot, especially when you're not getting any work because that personal work that you make can come full circle at some point down the line. So good Stuart spent a lot of years in Asia and he has huge bodies of work on Cambodia, Thailand, Japan, China, et cetera. And so he, uh, you know, I was like, that's a really good point. I should have shot more and I should have worked harder than I did. And it wasn't like I was slumping off. I mean, you know me, I'm pretty, pretty motivated and pretty driven, but I could have done more and I, I should have, and I should have known that. Point number three, I wish I knew that gear has very little to do with anything other than your base decision of what kind of work you're trying to make, right? So when I was very, very, very early in my photo career, I had, you know, two cameras and I thought the cameras and the bag and the vest and like what kind of film I was using and all the nonsense that you get wrapped up in. And it's so much easier to fixate on like, okay, I have two Nikon FM2 bodies and one is chrome and one is black and I'm going to put a little piece of red tape on the top of one and that's going to remind me that it's the color camera. It's all the nonsense that yeah. young, young photographers do that you look back on and you're like, you're an idiot. Why would you do any of that? It doesn't really matter. The, the equipment matters in the sense that you say, okay, my base decision of what I want this project to look like, maybe it's a color six by six, right? I want yeah. square, I want color, and then you do it and you move on. But it's so easy to get distracted down that path because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to go make good photographs. And so, so are you going to sit at your computer and do research, which is challenging, or are you just going to fixate on gear? And again, it's easy. It's lazy. You say to yourself, oh, this is great. Now it's like I have a new camera coming to me here, uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, and I'm super appreciative. The camera's coming from Sony, and I'm super appreciative to the folks at Sony who are, you know, got me this camera. But there's not like this 
intense fascination with the device itself. What I'm fascinated by is what I'm going to do with that camera. It, exactly. It's a tool. Yeah, it, and, you know, like yeah. we have a little DJI with a, with a gimbal on it, and it's a tool that you can easily use to capture what you're what you're going out to get you know i mean that's what it's all about what tool are you going to use yeah there's this big gap in the kind of coverage that i can do kind of motion i can create because i don't have a stabilized body and fuji only makes one stabilized body really which is the xt4 which i probably will end up getting because my twos are getting old and one of them is starting to act funky so that's probably but at the same time i'm like i don't it's like buying a computer do I get excited when I get a new computer? No, I just in my head say, oh my oh, God, man. this is going to be more efficient than my last one so I can yeah. spend more time away from this device. I mean, that's, in some weird way, that's how it works. The better <laughs> the device, the less time you have to spend with it. Jumping in here, the I think that Jared. another big point of that is it can be so easy for somebody to look at the photos made by other people and be like, well, I can never make photos that good because I don't have the equipment. Oh, yeah. Not realizing yeah. that. And so, like, they're limiting themselves and they don't even try to yeah. get better at taking photos with the equipment they have because they don't think it's good enough to make good photos. Why did Michael Jordan sell so many? Why did, why did Nike sell so many Air Jordans? You know, if you if you had his shoes, maybe you could do the same dunks that he was doing, right? Look, I used to the, the 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 Jared. That's a great point. And to me, the group that jumps out is uh, so I used to assist for two guys who were really good sports photographers. I used to assist for a guy named Rick Rickman, who won a Pulitzer in '84 for the coverage of the Olympics in L.A. And Rick could shoot pretty much any sport out there, right? And he was the middle distance runner in college. He was a good athlete. He's a tall, lanky dude that was pretty pretty you know fast to keep up with. And then I assisted for Peter Reed Miller, who was a Sports Illustrated photographer who also did work for co corporate work for Adidas and brands and stuff. And so and I was a terrible I love sports, but I was a terrible sports photographer. And we would sometimes go to these these events and I would, you know, Rick would say, here's a whatever, 300 or 400 millimeter lens. Go ahead and shoot. Well, yeah, you can give me all the equipment in the world. I can't I still can't shoot sports. Right. And the guys at Sports Illustrated were amazing to me because and the guys who shot baseball in particular were fascinating because you think, oh, if I had a 600, I could shoot baseball. Well, the truth is those guys who are really good are sitting in the dugout and they know the teams. They know the players and the pitchers and they know the strategy. Yeah. So they're like, oh, it's the bottom of the ninth, one out. They got a left-handed left-handed pitcher who throws a slider to a right-handed batter. He's going to hit to right field. And so they are setting up because they're able to study the game. It has nothing to do with the equipment. If you don't know the game, who cares what equipment you have? So it's a great point. I, I realized go. immediately I'm like, I'm never going to shoot golf. I'm never going to shoot tennis and this stuff because I suck at it. I, I love watching tennis. I love football. But I'm just not good at it, and you could give me the best equipment in the world, and I'm not going to come back with the goods. Point number four is I wish I knew to expand outside of photography. So I made a big mistake, which was when I discovered photography and I got serious about it, I immediately went all in. And I took the rest of my personal life, and I just forgot about it. I forgot about every single thing I did before I became a photographer. I used to do a lot of bird hunting. I used to do fishing. I grew up in a rural family. We were did a lot of bird hunting and fishing. I was a cyclist. I was I was hiking outdoors. I loved geology. I was collecting rocks. I was doing all this stuff. And it just was like this clean break. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, oh, if I'm gonna be a photographer, I have to go all in. And I'm just gonna that's all I'm gonna do and all I'm gonna talk about. I, I had this conversation with my mom, and this is gonna sound terrible. And I'm not bagging on my mom, but I thought it was hilarious. So we're talking about politics with my mom. And so we're talking and she and I'm talking to her about propaganda versus news. And I said, Mom, you have to know where to get news online because a lot of what you see now is propaganda from from both sides. And you have to learn to navigate and triangulate where it's, it, news is coming from and stories and then look at the sources. And she goes, well, how do you know all this? And I said, well, what did I study in college and what did I spend the first 10 years of my career doing? And she goes, I have no idea. And I go, I go journalism. Like I studied journalism and I think the reason she had no idea is that I wasn't a very interesting character during that time because the only thing I was doing was photography. The only thing I talked about, thought about, did, I stopped everything else 
and I just did photography. And it's just not smart. It's not smart. I should have. I wasn't reading like I should have been. I wasn't researching what was happening in the rest of the world outside of like where could I go to get pictures and do a story. I was boring. I just yeah. wasn't a very interesting dude. I think now I'm probably. I mean, there's probably plenty of people who know me that would beg to differ, but. I think I'm a lot more interesting now than I was back then. And the relevance, it's not that I'm, when I, those rare times when I get in the field to actually make pictures with intention, I'm serious about making pictures with intention, but it's so few and far between those chances to get into the field. I haven't been in the field in over a year. And so if I was only talking about photography and doing this, my wife would have probably left me 20 years ago. The people that I find interesting now are people who are far more well-rounded. They might do photography and they might be professional photographers, but when you talk to them, you can cover a range of topics. I wish I would have known that I could have been better off if I had used my college education on something related but unrelated to photography. So I studied, my major is in photojournalism and I have minors in Spanish and anthropology. If I was to do this again, I might flip that. I might major in anthropology and minor in photography because the playing field has changed. The business of photography, the industry, et cetera, it's much, much harder now. You could study business with a minor in photography. I don't know if I would go so all in on the photo thing. I wish I would have known that at the time because the anthropology and the Spanish in some weird way have been just as important as the photo education. There's so many opportunities for utilizing Spanish. Look at the state I live in. I live in yeah. New Mexico. It's a, it's a Spanish-speaking state, and so Spanish was huge. And anthropology is the study of human behavior, basically. And when you're in the field doing human-based documentary projects, you better be able to read the people around you. True and the anthro true anthropological true. society and the, the amount of data that you can study is just endless. We can almost yeah. summarize those first five points, which is broaden your horizons, you know. Ansel yeah. Adams was first before he became a photographer he was a concert pianist and he was studying to become a professional pianist he w was also an avid naturalist and environmentalist and used photography as a vehicle for that he might have had a million other interests but i know at least those three that he he used to round out his life you know it wasn't just obsession like you said with photography he was rounding things out. Henry Cartier-Bresson more or less left photography, right, to go back to yeah. his uh, pen and ink drawings and painting just because that was his another, you know, I think he conquered photography. So he thought, well, I'm going to go back to something I really love as well. So I think your point is let's be not two dimensional in our lives. Let's be multidimensional and yeah. bring that into our photography as well. We hope you liked that video, and if you want to see more just like that, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you can see all of our future videos. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this video with your friends. And finally, get out there and take your own images of life.